one more Sea Org member whose uh, recovery you attempted recovery you were a part of is Terry Gamboa in the late 80s. Late 80s? Correct. Tell us about that one. Terry Gamboa was the ED executive director of Author Services. That was L. Ron Hubbard's personal literary agent, personal organization that kept all his business and finances separate from the church, handled all his books, all his intellectual property, uh, handled his defense in the early 80s when he was alive. I was a legal executive over there, you know, trying to get the all clear to make things safe for Hubbard. We handle every aspect of him. After he died, Miscavige, myself, Will here, we all went over to RTC and did a purge over there because nothing much was happening at ASI anymore after Hubbard died. It didn't have that much importance. Um, Terry Blue, I believe it was late 80s, 89, maybe 90, I don't know, when he, back at that period. And again, this was one of those seven alert fire-ups because she worked in, intimately with Miscavige all through the all-clear period, um, knew about all the stuff that went on with the Hubbard finances and the church finances and Miscavige personally. So I got pulled into author services. Miscavige held a big powwow there and he brought in Mark Yeager, Mark Ingber, um, Ray Midoff, Greg Wilhere, Norman Starkey, who was the executor of the estate, right? <laughs> you know, they put in these affidavits like the executor of the estate is independent and doesn't answer to Miscavige. Well, Norman Starkey was, was the acting executive there, and of course, when Miscavige said leap, he asked how high. Everybody was there at attention, and I was there, because Miscavige was going to run a mission to intimidate the living hell out of Terry Gamboa. I don't even think the objective was to get her back. I think the intention was to scare the pants off of her, because this was the mission. All the people I mentioned, Greg, Norman, <laughs> Midoff, uh, that whole, uh, Jaeger, that whole lineup, which you guys have seen this before where they all get together in, a, in an array and confront people. The intention was to do that to Terry uh, and her husband. And we had PIs tracking her. This was several days after she had left. And we had PIs tailing her and her husband. They were driving across the country and they were heading towards Nashville. So we time this whole thing that it would be this whole confrontation in Nashville when they got to Nashville. Yeah, it's private investigators. Private investigators, right. Well, when I was out author services for this briefing, Miscavige turns to Norman and he says, Norman, did she have access to that safe? And in the safe, there were some kind of documents that he treasured. And I don't even recall what they were. They had to do with the estate. Uh, they may, have, they may have, estate. yeah, they may have had to do with the family and now they switched the wills up on, I don't know what it had. I just don't remember the significance of them. It was between Dave and Norman and Norman said, I don't know, sir. To which Miscavige went into these tyran tyrannical rages about Norman, you fool, you idiot. How do you know? And it was like, God, it sounded like the, you know, this could affect the exemption you know, of the, the tax exemption of the church, and it was like, I mean, the guy was really flipping out. He says to me, Marty, you have got to find out whether she got those documents, right? Well, I was reporting that she was carrying a briefcase with her. We were finding out through the private investigator, so I had informed Ms. Gavage that she had, you know, she had her, whatever they took with them, and one of the things she had was a briefcase, which was a little bit of an oddity person just doesn't generally have that and, and and I reported that she was bringing it into her hotel room and or leave you know sometimes leaving it in her car and so he got all fixated on I got to get into that you got to get into that briefcase because I think those documents are in there right so by any means necessary you find out you get into that briefcase Oh, those are words that came to you? That's what the orders I got from Miscavige. You get into that briefcase, I don't care what it takes. Do you have a PI who can do it? I said, I'll get a PI who can do it. And I went through Ingram and got a guy who was an expert at quickly uh, popping locks. Ingram is Jane Ingram. Right. And a we knew. An investigator who's worked for the church for years. Yeah. Now. And we knew that was a, a, a combo three tumbler combo lock. So I got a guy who, and I had him do it. 
show me, you know, he could go, you know, within 30 seconds, boom, any briefcase, you know, said, okay, that's the guy we need. So he flew out to Nashville and with another private investigator. And my mission, the mission was this, all those big executives I told you about, we're going to get her into a room and give her what, what is called an SRA. That's a term that Miscavige is very proud of having uh, developed, created, and it, that is now a part of the Scientology vernacular. It stands for severe reality adjustment. It means you get in somebody's face so hard that you adjust their reality, okay? That means you get right up in their face and scream and holler and rip them a new one is another one that's becoming part of the vernacular. They were to give her a six-on-one or two, because Fernando would be there, SRA, so she would be scared. She would never think about messing with the church. While she's doing that, Marty, you, by hook or by crook, get your hands on that briefcase, and you find out those documents are in there, and you get them back if they're there. And that's what happened. Went to Nashville. She had a... Um, room, the way I recall it was she had a room that overlooked the parking lot where her car was parked directly under it. And we were a little bit above, it was like f five feet off the ground, the room was, a little elevated. And we met in her room and then they said, let's go in our room because we're not, you know, and they diverted her across the hall, down the hall, into their room. And I had slipped a little something in her door so the door wouldn't close behind us as we left her room. And uh, and then while we were going down and the guys were piling into the other room and they sort of blocked out the sun, there were so many of them and they were so big compared to her, I slipped back out, went back down to her room, opened the door, um, gave a signal to the private investigator. He ran over, I think the briefcase was in the, her little pathfinder. The guy did Jimmy the lock because he was also an expert on popping car locks, pull the thing out. I'm keeping, I'm watching, and I'm going back to the, to the door to the hotel, looking down the hall, make sure she's not coming. And sure enough, she comes storming down the hall towards the room. I run over to the window. I tell the guy, beat it. He runs off with the beat briefcase. Terry comes into the room and starts interrogating. Marty, what are you doing in my room? What are you doing? What are you doing? You're up to something. You're planting. You know, she was like accusing me of all these stuff, you know? And I'm like, you know, I'm just acting, keeping cool under pressure and whatever. And I'm trying to divert her and saying, you know, I know what you're talking about. And I'm trying to divert her back to the other room so the guy can get the job done. Long and short of it is, the guy goes down to a payphone booth down the street where there's some light, pops the lock, opens it up sees that the, what we're looking for is not in there. It's just some personal papers of hers. Um, comes back and uh, slides the briefcase back in the car, locks it, and takes off. So that's how I accomplished my mission.